Hi, respiratory ultrasound enthusiasts. I'm Danny Burke, current critical care and point of care ultrasound fellow. I'd like to welcome you to part one of the introduction to long ultrasound modules and to your first step towards eye accuracy respiratory imaging at the point of care. Or as I like to think of it, ultrasound enhanced physical examination. In this first module, we'll cover some of the physics and general functioning of the ultrasound machine, how it generates the images we all look at, the screen display, and some imaging conventions. In the following modules, we'll discuss how to perform the lung ultrasound examination and the different findings you're likely to encounter. So, without further ado, let's get started. Here is an example of an ultrasound machine. They come in many shapes and sizes, but have the same general constituents. There is a hookup to get electricity into the machine via a standard outlet. This is generally on the back of the machine. It's a good idea to plug this in at the beginning of your exam to avoid the frustration of having the machine cut out on you mid-exam. Next, there is the screen where your image will be displayed, the keypad where you'll be able to adjust or add things to your image. The machine's processor that's responsible for a big part of all the ultrasound magic is also stored here. More on that later. Finally, there are the ultrasound probes or transducers that you place on the patient to acquire the ultrasound images. If you have more than one, you'll have to tell the machine which one you want to use. On this machine, there is a little button above the probe's connector that lights up when the, that probe is selected. We'll talk more about probes shortly. The ultrasound machine takes electric current and applies it cyclically to ceramic materials or crystals in the head of the ultrasound probe to make them expand and contract, which results in vibration. This is known as the reverse piezoelectric effect. Piezo meaning squeeze in Greek, so we're using electricity to squeeze the crystals. This vibration generates sound waves. This is the emission phase. The sound waves are transmitted to structures in the body. Some of these waves bounce off structures they encounter and return to the ultrasound probe. The returning sound waves make the crystal vibrate again. This is the listening phase. This vibration is converted into an electric signal. This is the piezoelectric effect. This electric signal is converted into different shades of black, white, or gray, depending on the amplitude of the returning ultrasounds. And the sum of all this information is translated into the image displayed on the screen. A lot goes into optimizing the ultrasound probe's ability to generate and receive ultrasound waves. All of these com components are fragile, and so it is very important to be careful with the probes, which mainly means ensure you don't drop them on the floor. Probes are also equipped with a probe marker on one side that will be important for orientation. More on that soon. After leaving the ultrasound probe, the ultrasound waves can behave in many different ways. Reflection happens when the ultrasound beam bounces straight off of a structure. This happens when the, the reflector is big and regular. Scatter happens when the ultrasound beam bounces off a structure the same size or smaller than the ultrasound waves themselves, such as cells in an organ, and gets split into multiple weak echoes that are reflect reflected in multiple directions. These eventually bounce all the way back to the probe and result in the grayish appearance of organs or the image of blood cells in a fluid. Organs appear brighter than blood because they contain more cells, or scatterers, per unit volume. Beams that are reflected or scattered back to the ultrasound probe can be analyzed and contribute to image generation. Ultrasounds can also be transmitted through structures and penetrate deeper. If it goes through one type of tissue into another, say from muscle to blood, the beam will be refracted and continue to penetrate deeper, but because the frequency is constant, but the speed is now changed, the wavelength will change. The angle will also be different, like when you look at something in water. This will result in unclear and sometimes confusing images. More on this later. Much of the beam is simply absorbed by the tissues and converted into heat. The amount of heat generated is minimal with standard diagnostic lung ultrasound exams and not sufficient to result in tissue damage. However, when ultrasounds are absorbed, 
they cannot contribute to image generation. The brightness or color of each pixel on the screen is determined by the amplitude of the ultrasound waves returning from the spot in the patient represented by that pixel. Liquids reflect echoes very little and so appear black. Tissues reflect echoes a fair amount and so appear gray. Bone and air reflect echoes almost completely and so appear white. Air will also appear white as it is a strong reflector when it interfaces with tissues given its very different acoustic impedance. More on that in a second. Unfortunately, if all of the echoes are reflected, none penetrate deeper into the patient and so we can't see any deeper. The machine knows where to place each pixel on the x-axis based on which part of the probe's head they return to. It knows where each pixel is on the y or depth axis based on the time it takes for the echo to leave the probe, be reflected by a tissue, and then return to the probe. Echoes that are reflected by deeper tissues take longer to return and so are placed deeper on the screen by the ultrasound machine. Optimal reflection happens when the ultrasound beam strikes a structure at 90 degrees. Otherwise, we get partial reflection and the image won't be as bright and clear. Acoustic impedance is the resistance ultrasounds face while traveling through tissues, like how sound transmit more easily through water than through brick. This depends on the density of a tissue. When there is a big difference in acoustic impedance, such as the interface between air and tissue or bone and tissue, this results in a high amplitude of beams reflected back to the probe. These interfaces show up brightly on the screen. Unfortunately, since almost the entire beam is reflected back to the probe, we can't see anything any deeper. This is why we can't see through bone with ultrasound, and why we need to put ultrasound gel between the transducer and the patient's skin to remove the air between them in order to allow ultrasound transfer. Higher frequency ultrasounds penetrate less but generate higher quality images because of the better re resolution they offer. This is the case for the linear transducer used for ultrasound guided vascular access. Lower frequency ultrasounds penetrate deeper but generate less sharp images because of their lower resolution. This is necessary when you want to view structures deeper than about 5 centimeters. This brings us to the topic of resolution. Axial resolution is the ability to separate two points on the y-axis or depth axis of the image. Higher frequency ultrasound transducers offer superior axial resolution. Lateral resolution is the ability to separate two points on the x-axis or the left to right axis of the image. This is optimized in a region of the beam called the focal zone. After the beam is generated by the transducer, it initially contracts to a maximum at the focal zone. This is generally at the middle of the ultrasound screen, though some machines will allow you to manipulate this. This means that if you want to optimize the lateral resolution of a structure, you should place that structure in the middle of the screen by adjusting the depth or, if your machine allows you to, simply by adjusting the focal zone. The same ph phenomenon occurs along the thickness axis of the probe. Since the image generated is a 2D image, but the ultrasound beam is in 3D, the image you see is a 2D compression of a slice of what is truly going on in the patient. This results in beam thickness resolution, or 
elevational resolution and it is also optimized in the focal zone. There is also temporal resolution, which determines the clarity of moving structures. Think of it as the frame rate. This is determined by the rate at which the transducer emits ultrasound pulses. Next, let's go into some of the basic modes of ultrasound and the screen display. The main mode you'll be using is 2D or B mode, B for brightness. In this mode, the ultrasound displays the image as varying shades of gray or black or white depending on the amplitude of echoes that are reflected back to the probe. By convention, the top of the screen is the nearest to the probe or skin and is named the near field. The bottom of the screen is named the far field. There is a scale to the right of the screen indicating the depth in centimeters. Also, by convention, the left of the screen represents the side closest to the patient's head, right, or front, depending on the orientation of the probe on the patient's skin. To ensure this is the case, there is a little probe marker on the screen displayed as a little dot. There is a matching marker on the transducer itself to make sure you stay oriented. The right of the screen is therefore oriented towards the patient's feet, left, or back. Structures that appear about the same shade of gray as the adjacent tissues are termed isoechoic. Structures that are darker shade of gray than the adjacent tissues are termed hypoechoic. Structures that are brighter are termed hyperechoic and structures that are black are termed anechoic. The next mode is M mode or motion mode. It is a time motion display of a single line which is chosen from the 2D screen. Once you've chosen the line you want to observe, you can get an image of all the points along that line on the vertical axis as they vary in time on the horizontal axis. In other words, we see how all the points on that line are changing in time, but we can see all the changes in time on one image. Its main advantage is its great temporal resolution, which makes it good for depicting dynamic phenomena or making time sensitive measurements such as the difference in the thickness of the diaphragm during inspiration and expiration. The last of the main ultrasound modes is Doppler, or more specifically, color Doppler in lung ultrasound. When you choose the color function on the ultrasound machine, a box appears on the display. Using Doppler phenomenon, the ultrasound detects the direction of moving particles blue being away from the transducer and red being towards it, and gives us an idea of their speed. Brighter colors indicate higher speeds. <clears throat> the main utility of color Doppler in lung ultrasound is detecting the presence of blood flow to differentiate between a consolidated lung, which should have blood flow, or a very complex pleural effusion, which would not be expected to have blood flow. A frequently used trick to remember which color is associated with which direction of blood flow is BART or blue away and red towards. The image of Bart Simpson with the red shirt on top and the blue shorts on bottom can be helpful for this. It's important to note that the red and blue colors have absolutely nothing to do with whether blood flow is arterial or venous. Next. Let's discuss the different types of probes or transducers you will be using. There are many different shapes and types of probes, but you will mainly be using three. The convex or curvy linear probe, which is a low frequency 2 to 5 megahertz probe with a large footprint, which is good for getting a big picture of deeper structures. Its big footprint doesn't allow you to maneuver well in the rib spaces, but it does allow you to see through multiple rib spaces at the same time. 
you'll recognize the linear probe if you've ever used it to assist you in arterial or central venous line insertion. It is a high frequency probe, usually in the 6 to 13 megahertz range, which allows for high resolution images of superficial structures down to about 5 centimeters. This is often useful for accessing super superficial blood vessels or for imaging the pleura. The final probe is the phase array probe. It is a low frequency probe, 1 to 5 megahertz, with a small footprint. It gives us a pie shaped image. Its small footprint is useful for getting in between ribs in order to image structures. Like the curvy linear probe, it allows us to image deeper structures. Because of the, uh, the way the ultrasounds are fired from the probe, we are able to get good temporal resolution which is useful when imaging rapidly moving structures like the heart. Next, let's go over the controls of the ultrasound machine, or what is sometimes referred to as nobology. The location and assortments of knobs and buttons will vary from machine to machine, but most will have the main same ones. Starting from the top, these buttons allow us to adjust functions that will be displayed at the bottom of the screen. These vary depending on the mode, but often include the level of penetration desired, general resolution for penetration. Resolution can be useful if you have a very echogenic patient to get a better picture, while penetration helps image deeper structures that are not well seen on other modes. Unfortunately, though, with the penetration function, the images will often appear a little blurry. Gen, or general, is the default mode and will be sufficient in the extreme majority of settings. Blurry. Next, there's a dynamic range. This is one way to adjust the image contrast. The lower the dynamic range, the less shades of gray that will be in the image. So things will either be very gray, very black, or very white, and contrast will be increased. The higher the dynamic range, the more shades of gray there will be, and the less contrast there will be. Low dynamic range helps eliminate noise or bring out contrast, while high dynamic range helps bring out texture. The next button allows you to choose whether or not you want a guide in the center of the screen. This is used for ultrasound guided procedures. The next button is multi-beam. This function makes the probe send out multiple beams at multiple angles. It helps you see around corners and reduce artifacts from echoic structures in the near field. Understandably, this should generally be turned off for lung ultrasound when we are trying to bring out artifacts. THI refers to tissue harmonics imaging which utilizes secondary waves generated by distortion of the main wave in the tissues or harmonic waves to help enhance the image. Unfortunately, this also decreases reverberation artifact, and so this function is best turned off for long ultrasound. By pressing the next button, you can go to the second page of options, including adjusting the brightness of the screen, the position of the probe marker indicator, which should always be at the top left for long ultrasound, the length of clips, which should be set at six seconds by convention at LHSC. This round button is the power button for turning on and off the machine. Just below this row, we have a fairly standard keyboard. By touching the text button here, you can type text into your image. This is important for labeling your images so you and others can know where your clips were taken. The next row of buttons include patient which allows you to go back to the patient information you put in at the beginning of the exam. There is also the exam button. This allows you to switch between different exam types with the same probe such as cardiac, abdominal, lung, etc. This is adjusts 
the presets of the exam to maximize certain functions such as temporal resolution among other things. For long ultrasound, the lung preset can be used if available as this is designed to maximize artifacts that we'll be using. If not, an abdominal preset can be used and may even be a better choice if trying to view deeper structures like pleural effusions or consolidations. The review button allows you to review the images you've acquired thus far and, if you're not in, the, in an exam mode, to select from the bank of exams that are saved on the machine's hard drive. The report and setup buttons aren't going to be used during your exam. At the lower level, and starting from the left, we have the gain adjustment, which is used to adjust how dark or bright the screen is. We can use this to adjust the overall image selectively the near field or selectively the far field. There is also an automatic adjustment button but that is rarely used. Next there is the depth adjustment. Ideally the structure of interest is placed in the middle of the screen or the focal zone to optimize lateral resolution. Just under that there is a zoom function we can use to selectively enlarge a portion of the image. The calcs button allows us to use pre-programmed equations and measurements, but this is rarely of use in long ultrasound. The set button is also not used. The calipers allow us to measure a structure on a still image. The select button acts as a left button on a computer mouse. The freeze button allows us to freeze the image currently on the screen. On the Sonosite edge, we can then use the gain buttons to scroll backwards and forwards in time. The touchpad allows us to move the cursor on the screen when measuring or selecting structures. The clip button allows us to record the following few seconds of the exam onto the hard drive for later viewing and for storage. QPath at LHSC. The save button records a still image to the exam and to the hard drive. The save calc and update buttons are not used. The A and B buttons functions can be programmed into the machine. At LHSC they are used to begin and end an exam. Then there are different uh, there are the different ultrasounds modes we can choose from. Next, let's go over some of the nomenclature around how we move the ultrasound probe. There are four basic motions you can do. Sliding is moving the entire probe on the patient's skin at a fixed angle. This is the main motion you use to get from one point to another or to look for a window. Tilting, also called fanning or sweeping, refers to changing the angle on the long axis of the probe while staying in the same position on the patient's skin. This is used to scan through structures to get several cross-sectional images from the same window or place on the skin. Rotating refers to a screwing-like motion, again while staying on the same place on the patient's skin. This is used to change imaging planes, i.e. to go from imaging the long axis of an organ to the short axis or to go from a transverse image to a sagittal or coronal image and vice versa. Finally, rocking means pressing one of the sides of the probe into the patient while maintaining the same position on the patient. This is used to center structures of interest on the screen. Let's talk briefly about how to acquire the images. First, select the probe you wish to choose. Next, start an exam and enter the necessary patient information into the machine. At LHSC, this is done by pressing the A or B button. Next, make sure the probe marker indicator is at the upper left of the screen. 
You'll then make sure the machine is in the correct exam preset, either long or abdominal, and that multi-beam and THI are off to maximize artifact generation. The transducer should be held like a pen, perpendicular to the chest wall, with the transducer orientation marker pointing toward the patient's head. Much like auscultation, you need to examine a few different regions to get a summary idea of what's going on in the patient's lungs. Here at LHSC, we use a four point or window per hemithorax exam. This is a minimum and you should feel encouraged to examine where you think something may be happening. Again, like auscultation. The four routine exam points are the anterior chest wall at the level of the second or third rib interspace, the anterior axillary line at about the level of the fifth interspace, the costophrenic angle along the mid axillary line. You'll find this zone by starting high on the chest in the mid axillary line and sliding down until you find pleura and the upper abdominal organs. The posterolateral alveolar pleural syndrome or PLAPS point. You'll find this zone at the costophrenic angle but this time along the posterior axillary line. This is an important point because it is often the most dependent region of the lung and so where pathology tends to accumulate. In the upper lung zones, so points one and two, the optimal depth for assessing the pleura will be whatever depth that makes the pleura appear in the middle to enhance resolution. When assessing for the presence of repetitive A lines or for the presence of B lines, a depth of approximately 11 to 13 centimeters is generally the best way to go. When assessing points 3 and 4, generally a good starting point for depth is 16 to 19 centimeters deep. You will want to be able to see as far as possible into the far field, so until you get to about spine. If there is a structure of interest that you are trying to evaluate, say for the presence of dynamic air bronchograms, again you will want to put this in the focal zone, so in the middle of the screen to enhance resolution. Also, for points 3 and 4, you will be looking through the abdominal organs to look at the lung. Since tissue transmits ultrasound better than aerated lung, it'll often be important to use the abdominal organs to look into the lung. This may require rocking the probe upward slightly. Since the left abdominal solid organ, the spleen, is more posterior than the liver, it may be necessary to adjust the positions of points 3 and 4 slightly posterior on the left side of the patient in order to use the spleen as your window into the lung. The PLAPS point deserves special mention. The PLAPS point may be easier to visualize with the transducer gripped in the palm like you might hold a bottle. It is crucial that you slide the probe underneath the patient so that the probe's head is at least partially pointing anteriorly. Otherwise, you may end up with images that over or underestimate what's really going on inside the patient. This may require pushing the back of the probe into the patient's bed or lifting or rotating the patient. It may seem like a lot of work, but acquired correctly, the PLAPS point will identify more than 90% of pleural effusions in alveolar consolidation given its dependent uh, position. That's all for this segment. Take a little break before coming back to our next portion of the tutorials, which will focus on important ultrasound artifacts that are used for interpreting lung ultrasound. Also, don't forget to check out westernsano.com for more information, tutorials, and further lectures.